So no, that's that's really good. And um, Adrian, obviously, we talk about this a little bit more in a minute. How do you get into the field of the whole area of email deliverability? And I think well, am I correct in saying you were an Infusionsoft sort of active campaign specialist first? Yeah. So it was, almost by, it was by accident, I guess. Um, a few clients I worked with had particularly difficult audiences that they were trying to email. Um, and the first time that happened was about eight years ago. And I was so wet behind the ears at that point, I couldn't help them. And I had to let them go and, and gave up and all that stuff. But then a few years later on, must be about six years ago now, I had other clients with similar problems. Um, I'd worked out how to solve one particular problem and started joining the dots and thinking, well, if this bit over here can solve one problem and this bit over here needs this solution how can i bring it all together so that that started it and then i've just been exploring other solutions since then working out keeping keeping tabs on how the world has changed and suddenly here we are in 2021 where the world is very different to even three years ago so yeah it's been wow. quite a journey yeah it, it certainly has and probably you're also very much of this time now in terms of what you provide aren't you in terms of people looking for new routes of marketing and uh, and email deliverability is a very big subject. So and that's how I got to know Adrian to start with. And um, so uh, so we're going to be going live in about 15 seconds officially. Uh, so uh, welcome every, all of those of you who joined us already. So if you could very kindly introduce yourselves in the chat, a very quick welcome to uh, Tom or Thomas. Uh, well done for joining us from sunny Scotland. Uh, Renato, welcome. Delighted that you have joined us today, uh, Thomas. I have no idea what the weather's like in Cyprus today, but welcome on board. Uh, Jane, hello. Nice to see you. And Jonathan Price. So we, we saw each other yesterday online. Um, and we've got Mike G as well. So obviously any all of those who have joined us as you, uh, you know, do introduce yourselves in the chat, we'll go from there. So what we'll do now is we will officially get started. So just bear me a second. There we go. So this is the topic for today. Um, the topic, uh, Adrian's very kindly volunteered his time today, and it's basically talk about how to avoid the spam folder and double your open rates. And that is quite a big claim, but I can assure you that what uh, Adrian does talk about and what he does practice and do is precisely that, because I can speak from first-hand experience. And um, what, uh, in terms of, as an organization, a bit of interaction from ourselves to start with, we are very much here to help you on your journey. Um, uh, as an organization, we're very passionate working with CEOs and leaders to help them to grow the business. But quite often, it's a, a very lonely journey for a company of one. Then, you know, you ideally need other people to be able to work with who are there to support you and care about what you do. Equally, if you're a company of a thousand, similar problem. It's just that you, because you may not be able to open up and confide in your uh, other uh, fellow peers, as it were. Um, and what we're here to do is to make sure that you've got good strategies for growth. And uh, for those who are joining us today on Facebook or YouTube, it'd be really appreciated if you could share your um, what you're watching uh, via the channels. Uh, it really helps us to keep these uh, live streams going because it obviously um, means that we can expand the audience. And if you do enjoy it, obviously do like uh, what you hear today. So um, we certainly really appreciate that. And um, a little bit what we talked about just a moment or two again, but do introduce, introduce yourself in the chat, tell us what you're passionate about, why you do it, and how you like to make a difference. And Adrian did say in advance of today that he loves a challenging questions. And believe me, there is someone who's joining us today, I believe, who actually sent through a very challenging question uh, earlier on. And um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I understand the question, but apparently Adrian does. <laughs> Uh, we should be able to have a little bit of fun with this anyway, so so that'll be good. So don't don't wait to a particular point necessarily to ask a question. Just ask them in the chat, and we'll bring up at different points. Um, a little bit more of an interaction in terms of what we specialise in. It is about um, we want to make a difference, and what we want to be known for is about helping people to bring their sales forward, amplify their brand, and get their time back. So we can show you the how, the right methodologies and systems to achieve those type of results. And uh, in terms of a quick introduction from me, before we move on to uh, to Adrian, um, Business Growth Bureau was formed about seven years ago. I'm very passionate on building what I class as circular relationships. It, to me, it's really important that you think of all your stakeholders and find a way of giving back, okay? And um, a lot of 
larger companies will talk about win-win. As I mentioned before, invariably that means a win-lose. Um, you know, the larger company perceiving they've got more power and therefore, you, you know, as a smaller supplier, um, you perhaps having to agree to something which you're not entirely comfortable with. I actually think if you reward everyone through the different relationships you have, make them feel good, guess what? It tends to come back in abundance. And um, I'm delighted to have Mural joining me today. Um, Mural's uh, uh, been my rock as far as uh, business growth period is concerned on, on my previous ventures for about 12, 13 years now, Mural. Is that, is that right? Yes, for my sins. Yes, I and mean, there's no escape. So Mural behind the scenes is... I think it'd be fair to say what INSA is to Adrian. Is that right, Adrian? Yep, I think so. Yeah, INSA, by the way, is um, Adrian's uh, wife. And um, it is wife, not partner. Is that correct? It is Adrian? wife, wife and, and co-business owner and um, person who keeps me sane on the straight and narrow um, is my conscience, um, is more organised than me. That's, that's enough. <laughs> And for, for, fortunately for a sins, is not married to me. My my real wife, my, my real wife is, is next door at the moment. Uh, so be careful where this conversation is going. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so and what I'd like to do is now um, come over to Adrian, and we're going to obviously got some great points to discuss today. Uh, but what I'm really interested to understand, actually, um, really is who the real Adrian Savage is, because. I think like all entrepreneurs, we've all had our perhaps demons to deal with either in business or in our personal lives or quite often uh, both. And um, Adrian, could you just give a little bit of an insight? Because it's been quite a bit of, bit of a journey for you personally, hasn't it, as well? And obviously, it's through some of these pains and tribulations that led you to forming deliverability dashboards uh, now and terms of what you're doing. So you are just gives a little bit of backdrop into yourself, uh, Adrian. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I guess if, if I do this in the right order, I guess um, it's probably geek followed by dad followed by entrepreneur. So that's probably the kind of order that it's come. Um, I mean, my, my, my kids are now 19 and nearly 22. So when when I discovered entrepreneurship about 10 years ago, then they were obviously much younger. And at that point, then um there's a very different relationship to now, whereas, you know, anyone with teenage or 20 something year old children knows that it can become a very, very expensive um, thing to, 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 to get to. Um, but certainly back then when I was just starting the business, it was a very different, different place to be in. Um, but I think the big thing was just how I've always been a geek. Now, just in case anyone's worried that I'm going to really geek out and go into the techie stuff today, I have taken my anti-geek pills before I came on, on the session. So hopefully I won't go too deep into stuff. Um, although saying that, um, having, having seen Alex's question, then maybe I might have to geek out a little bit for that bit. Um, but it all my, my kind of journey into geekdom started when I was about seven or eight years old, something like that. My dad worked for Staffordshire County Council because I was born in Stoke-on-Trent, still live in Staffordshire now. Um, and my dad was forward-looking enough to take up the opportunity of bringing a computer home to help him do his work. Um, or at least that was the that was the idea. Um, he was so he, I remember he turned up with a, a, an Apple II computer um, back in yeah, the early eighties. And I remember him trying to make the thing work. And you know, seven, eight-year-old Adrian, whatever it was, I just kind of pounced on it, stole the manuals, went away, read them, um, and start showing dad how to use the computer. So that was that was the start of it. You know, for most for most people, it was the parents get the kids to show them how to program the video recorder. If you if you're old enough to remember that kind of thing, I kind of took that one step further, and it was here's how you make the computer work. Um, so then I grew up with computers around me. Um, I had my, I made, I made my first money from writing computer software when I was about eight or nine. I had a, a little program published in what was then Practical Computing Magazine. Um, I've, st I've still got the original magazine. I'm very proud that I've got that and the newspaper clipping that went with it when my, my dad embarrassed me and had me, uh, the, the local, uh, the Evening Sentinel reporter came out and took the, the obligatory photo with the, with the cringe, cringe, making headline whiz kid at computer so i've still got all that somewhere hidden away so that was kind of my 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 life through you know um through childhood um always doing stuff with computers um 
the school I went to didn't have any kind of computer science or computing GCSE or anything like that. So I had to wait until I went to college to do A-levels when I could finally start formally studying computing. Did the did the, the university thing and got a computer science degree. Um, and then did, did what you, you normally do if you go to university, you go and, you go and get a job for someone. Um, and I would probably still be in that job now doing IT, technology, telecom stuff um, if I hadn't had a few kind of personal things happen along the way so th and that's probably what's been the biggest driver for me i guess because um you know did the the the, the fairly stereotypical thing get married have not not quite 2.4 children only two point two was enough um and then it got to around let me think it's getting on for 13 yeah 13 a bit years ago now um very sadly my marriage came to an end and that was a real defining moment because i i'd had a very good relationship with my kids um and like a lot of dads unfortunately when you move out then things change massively um you know i've still one, one of the biggest memories that, that i'll never forget is as i was kind of walking out of the front door for the last time and my son ben was just five at the time and i still remember him now and he just grabbed my legs and he just he was just shouting daddy don't go and that was that was a tough thing to do because it was that kind of cemented in my mind how important my kids were to me so I had to do everything that I could to make sure I was looking after them <clears throat> and you know it was a few years after that I met in so we got married um and the challenge at that point then was my then ex-wife had to move to the other end of the country with the kids. And that was the real kind of hammer blow for me because I got to the point where I was seeing them, you know, one, two, maybe three times a week and everything was quite right. You know, it was, it was working nicely. Um, and then suddenly that went to the point where it was a, a five hour journey each way because you had to drive through Oxford, Birmingham, Liverpool, you know, the whole, the whole way up. So it was you know, on a, on a Friday night, you just couldn't do it pretty much. It was a horrific journey. Um, and I had to have time off work to go and see the kids. It meant I was only seeing them once every third weekend and going from two or three times a week to every third weekend was an absolute killer for me. Um, so that was my big catalyst for change. I discovered the world of personal development, self-development, went to seminars, things like that. And I realized there was actually life beyond be just having a job. And that was when I discovered rather late in my life, compared to some people, I discovered about the potential of being an entrepreneur. Um, and it was only within probably a year of that that I ended up quitting my job. Um, not quite sure what I was going to do at the start, which was interesting. Um, I had all kinds of crazy ideas. Um, but luckily, I started to learn about marketing. And I realized that there was an opportunity for me to couple up my geekiness with marketing technology and start to help people not just do email marketing, which is what we're going to talk about today, but the, the kind of the more in-depth version of that around marketing automation. So it's around making sure not just blasting people with emails, but making sure that you're actually putting decent processes in place, decent lead generation, automated follow-up, all the things that, that really successful marketers do. And there's lots of people that, that talk about this much more effectively than I do these days. So that was how it all started. And I think we covered just before we went live how I, you know, in the early days, this would have been about probably 2013, 2014, something like that. I had a few clients where they were struggling to get their emails through to their audience. And that's because they had a very tough audience. Um, you know, it was might have been financial services or something like that. And at that point, I didn't know how to solve their problem. I had to let them go. They said, well, we're giving up on this marketing automation nonsense. We can't speak to anyone. Um, so that was kind of game over for that client. And I carried on being an infusions off consultant and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we got to, must have been about 2014, I think it was, where I had another client and they had the same problem. They were they they had some very high profile customers. They were sending all of their um, client related information out through Infusionsoft and the emails weren't getting through again. But luckily, because I'd kind of explored my geekiness by then, I'd found out I had another client where they had a website that was sending out login information from a membership site and that wasn't getting through. So I'd worked out how to solve the problem for the website and I thought, aha, is there a way that I can use the same solution to then work with Infusionsoft? So many months of blood, blood, sweat and tears later, I found out how to connect Infusionsoft up to other email platforms and actually divert the emails from Infusionsoft via a third party and hey presto, they 
landed in the inbox. So that was my kind of um, my first exposure to email deliverability and solving people's problems. I've always been a problem solver since I was a kid. So that's that's the big thing for me is I just I just love being able to make something work, make something better, that kind of thing. So that's that's a big part of it. Um, so that's how my we delivered our email software got off the ground because I realized if I'd fix this problem for this one client, the chances were that other people needed that as well. Um, and although it is a very, very niche solution, it is still out there. And I've got a handful of clients that come on board every every year. Um, we know one quite well on this call, I think. Um, and I think you know, that was that was how it all started. But I kind of ignored the messages from the universe to some extent. I carried on doing this kind of generalist stuff, being an infusion soft consultant, trying to do a bit of marketing agency stuff for people. And all of that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, the, the first business that I launched in about 2011, 2012, that went bump at the start of 2015 because I'd made all the mistakes that so many rookie business owners make. Um, unfortunately, that meant that I was personally liable for a lot of the business debt, which meant that I had to go through the whole bankruptcy thing. So that was that was quite an interesting time. Um, but then that gave me the chance to learn from those mistakes, rebuild everything that kind of coincided with as the We Deliver software came, came about. Um, and then more recently, I finally got this kind of wake up call, for want of a better word for it, to say, why are you still messing about with all this generalist stuff when you know something about email deliverability and there's very few other people and there's all these things happening and people need help with that? So luckily for me, because, you know, even even as a stereotypical man who just doesn't listen and doesn't get the message, um, I finally I finally woke up, smelt the coffee without having to have a piano dropped on me or something like that um, to realize that if I focus just on helping people get their emails delivered, I might find it's a bit bit easier easier i might find it's a bit more financially rewarding as well because obviously the more you can specialize the more you can niche down then the more likely people are to pay for that expertise so that has borne itself out i'm very very you know very happy to say that things have got so much easier in the last few years because everyone who i work with knows exactly what i do if they need my help they're willing to pay a bit of a premium for it because you know it's it's something where as long as i can solve their problem then they will get a great benefit from it um and and think things have really gone very, very nicely indeed since then. It's been, it's, it's been there's been a lot of lessons learned along the way, um, and I'm still learning today. But you know, I've, I'm finally very proud to say that I found something that I'm good at, I love, and it's something that I'm actually getting rewarded for. So it's you know, plenty of bumps in the road. I'm sure there's going to be some more, but that's all part of life. Oh, lovely, Adrian. Thank you very much for that, and also thank you for. Um, also opening up in the way you have. And, and I think it should um, inspire many people on this call as well, because uh, uh, obviously you've had your personal challenges with your your kids moving away and your wife moving away and so on. And obviously you've had to try and sort of manage that. And obviously you perhaps had some miss, very long periods of missed moments as you were with them as been growing up. Um, but equally, the other part is the fact you've learned from a school of hard locks. I've certainly made a few mistakes along my way. And if you are an entrepreneur which is looking to really grow a business, invariably, uh, one of the characteristics of an entrepreneur is you tend to fall, fall in love with the, uh, the vision or the dream. So something going wrong doesn't even come into the psyche, um, as it were. And uh, I think the fact is, uh, Adrian, and I, was, I think some of us myself as well, if we hadn't gone through this process, we wouldn't be working in or creating or working with what we've got today. So it's, it's been part of the journey because it helps what's defined us as well, hasn't it? So uh, I'm really grateful for that. Um, what I'd like to do now is to focus a little bit more on the main topics, if that's all right with you, Adrian, sure. um, for today. And uh, I have to say, just to give a slight uh, explanation in terms of the background um, with, with Adrian, uh, we, we ourselves have reached out for his help. And he's been, because we've got a very large email list, got about 58,000 people in business in our email list. Um, one of the big challenges, which I'll just touch on briefly now before we start to get into this, is that um, uh, once you start to get a certain size of the list, unless you are very active in the way you manage those people in that list, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of email ends up in the spam folder, and yet it's not necessarily spam at all. It's just a case that, uh, and this is the part I don't really still understand now, is that um, perhaps the people like the Googles and Microsofts of this world just measure email deliverability and engagement and how many are opened, 
but they forget there's multiple ways that people will engage with you. So, you know, we engage through LinkedIn, we engage through Facebook, possibly Instagram. Um, they may all be interactions which are going on behind the scenes, which Google doesn't know about or Microsoft doesn't know about. And th their perception could be just because you're not open an email that you're not, that person's not engaged. Well, actually, they may be engaging through other mediums. So I think this is a really big topic today, and I think there's a lot of learning from it. Um, so what we're going to cover today is really what, what is email deliverability and how does it affect you in business, especially if you're looking to grow a more sizable list and in, an engaged uh, prospect or customer list, how the rules have changed. Uh, you know, for example, are you aware that virtually, and Adrian, correct me if I've got any of this wrong, by the way, that every uh, email is pretty well read by a bot. Um, you would like to think all our emails are private. Actually, they're not really. There is encryption there, but Adrian, no doubt, will explain all that. But what I would say is that you know it is being scanned. It, that can affect uh, the ability if you use certain words or phrases in there. Um, it'd be good to understand about the big three and how they control your email, and why do you need to change the way you send emails uh, to increase the chance of deliverability and what mistakes you can learn from what you're doing so you end up with much more success. Um, so I haven't set you up today, Adrian. Um, as a matter of interest, Alex, Alex Redden, if you're on this call today, just do say hello in the chat because uh, I know you've got quite a big question for us later on. And, yeah, I think we uh, supported Alex's comments earlier on, Rupert. So he's yeah, yeah, he's with us. Excellent. So he's here. So um, Alex has saved up a really nice question, which we'll save for later on, I think. Um, so good luck with that one, Adrian. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so I think what we'll do is we'll get to the meat of the interview now, if that's all right. Um, so Mira, if I could just let you monitor things a bit behind the scenes, just make sure everything's covered off, and uh, we'll focus on uh, Adrian. Uh, so um, Adrian, in terms of... Um, First of all, let's start off with email deliverability and how does it affect you. What do you mean by, first of all, email deliverability? What, what does that okay. mean? Okay, so this is probably the most misunderstood term because there's actually there's, there's, there's two different terms that people sometimes use interchangeably because we've got delivery and then we've got deliverability. And there's two very different parts to it because let's assume for a moment, I'll use MailChimp as an example because that's that's a, a platform that almost everyone has heard of. And many, you know, we've got millions of businesses use MailChimp to build an email list and send you know hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of emails out to the, to their audience. And MailChimp has one very simple job, um, and that is to get that email, um, you know, whether and it doesn't matter how many there are, it will do the same thing, just you know hundreds or thousands of times or whatever. But the job that MailChimp has is to get that email accepted by the provider who's running the mailbox. So let's assuming I'm sending an email to my audience and you're in my audience, Rupert. Um, I'll assume for a minute, just to keep it simple, that you just you, your, your email is through Google. Um, so I'm using Infusionsoft to send my emails now. It's now called Keep, just to confuse everyone. Um, but all that Infusionsoft has got to do is it's got to knock on the door of Google's mail server and say, hello, I've got an email from Adrian for Rupert. And then Google will accept that message and either say, yes, I'm going to deliver it, or Google will say, no, I don't want to receive this email. And as long as Google says, yes, I'm accepting this email, Infusionsoft or MailChimp or whoever it is, they have done their job. And the mail has been delivered. You know, it's, it's equivalent to the postman putting the letter through the box, through through the through the letter box in the door. If the postman's put it through, it's been delivered. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't mean the dog hasn't just been waiting on the other side of the door to grab it, run away, and chew it up and and throw it in the fire or something like that. So, just because the email has been delivered. There's no guarantee that that person is going to see that email. And this is where the deliverability comes in, because all that MailChimp or Infusionsoft or ActiveCampaign, all they have to do is get that email to the mailbox provider. So as long as Google or Microsoft or whoever have said, yes, I've accepted this email, then that job is done. And that's why you see most of the big email marketing platforms saying that we have a 99.99% .99 delivery rate because they do. Um, you know, the only time that emails don't get through are if an email bounces because the email address doesn't exist anymore, or maybe because the person you're mailing has run out of, 
of space in their inbox, or very occasionally, then the email might get rejected because um, maybe Google thinks that you're sending spam or something like that. So occasionally it can get rejected at that point, but normally it gets received. And then this is where the deliverability comes into it. And this is where you as a sender of email have got pretty much all of the control over what happens. Because where while it's your email provider's job to get the email to the recipient's mailbox server, it's then your job to, to behave like a good internet citizen and make sure that you're not doing lots of bad things with your emails because the more you damage your reputation, the less likely it is that your email is going to get through. So deliverability is this whole thing about now the email has been delivered to the server, is it going to go into the inbox? Is it going to the promotions tab? Is it going to the junk, the spam, the clutter? You know, there's the challenge that we face is that we have an enemy. Um, we have spammers. Um, and typically, in any given month, there are about 400 billion emails sent around the world. Now, the challenge that we face is that 85% of those emails are reported or identified as spam. So only 15% of the emails that are sent in the world are considered legitimate. So that is a big, that's a big challenge to start with because it means that we are competing against the spammers all the time. And it's interesting because the numbers for January this year have actually dropped. Is about probably about 40% of the email volume has dropped off in the last year, which is very, very interesting. It shows how much of an impact that the pandemic's had at the moment. Emails have dropped. But the interesting thing is that the the percentage and the ratio is the same. It's still about 85% spam, 15% legitimate. So that's the enemy that we're up against. And obviously, you know, if you were a mailbox provider like, you know, Google or Microsoft or whatever, your job is to try and filter out all this garbage that gets sent out as spam because we don't like receiving spam. And then yeah. in an ideal world, then we want Google or Microsoft or whoever to only put the legitimate emails into the inbox. And the challenge we face is they don't always do a very good job of it. So it's our job to make it as easy as possible for them to identify that our emails are okay. And the simple solution to that is to not do, not do what the spammers do. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how can we behave like a legitimate sender and not do the things that spammers do? If we can do that, then we've got a much higher chance of the emails making it into the inbox. <clears throat> yeah. it's, it's really that very interesting subject. And of course, added to the mix as well, you've got other things as well, haven't you? For example, I think it was Apple, was it a few weeks ago, had an issue with deliverability to their own Apple's users' inboxes and emails yeah. were bouncing. So people like Infusionsoft and Mailchimp and others were seeing it as a being a bounce, but actually the problem was actually on the Apple side, I believe. And I think Microsoft and Google have had yeah, other... yeah, Google had a really big outage. I think it was was it December last year? I think some it was November December last year, where you know we were hit because we use we use G Suite. We couldn't log into our Google accounts at all, and like, the whole world stopped for you know four or five hours while Google had this hiccup. And yeah, in that time, they did actually reject millions of emails, so things went horribly wrong. The good news is that's very rare. Um, but you know, there's plenty of other things that can and do go wrong along the way. So what our job is as people sending emails to our audience is to make sure that we're, we're just stacking the odds as much as possible in our favor so that if we send an email, we'd like to have a reasonably good um, idea that it's actually going to, to get through. Now, is it okay if I just quickly ask a question to everyone just so we can get a bit yeah, of feedback? Right, well, I'm sorry. That I'm kind of pitching this in the right direction because what I'd love to know is you've heard a lot about me. I'd love to know a bit more about which of you watching now are actually sending marketing emails at the moment. If you're sending marketing emails, then what platform do you use? Is it something like MailChimp or Active Campaign? Um, how many people are on your email list? Is it a few hundred? Is it thousands? Is it tens of thousands? And if you've got any particular questions that um, haven't already been submitted, then I love this to be as interactive as possible. So I'm quite happy to see comments and questions come in as we're talking. Um, I know there's sometimes a little bit of a lag with Facebook Live, so I'll keep an eye on the comments and questions and kind of come back to them if, if necessary. Um, but the more you can ask the questions, the more you can get the comments in, the more that I can make this. You know, I like interactive discussions. I love hearing things from the audience. So please do, don't don't be shy. Let me know where, where you're at right now. Um, if you've got any challenges, that would be great. And questions all the way through, comments, the more the merrier. So that's the, okay. that's the important bit. <clears throat> Yeah, lovely. And I, I would actually thank you very much for that. Uh, so, Gerish, you said 600 odd, um, uh, but you don't email regularly. 
Um, whilst people are just replying to that, a bit of a question related to this. Uh, it's not on the sheet here, but I think it's very relevant. I think I'm correct in saying there are um, about a thousand words and phrases which uh, can affect email deliverability in quite a big way. Is that correct? So I think there's yeah, any thought it's a very, very tough one to answer that because, you know, again, I mean, this is probably a good time to explain how the rules of email have changed so much over the years. Because let's let's go back to the halcyon days of 2014. Um, back then, there was very little artificial intelligence, and the the main way that people sold things to their audience was by build, build, building the biggest email list they could. You know, the more tens or hundreds of thousands, the better. And then they would just email the hell out of their audience as many times as they could, and they just keep, you know blasting them with emails until people either buy or they die or they unsubscribe. And that was the old way of doing it. And it was very, 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 very easy. Um, and, you know, it was all about quantity, not quality. And that's how things have really changed now. It's completely gone the other way around. Um, but back in those days, there was very much a whole list of, you know, the dictionary of spam words that would trigger the very, very basic spam filters they had back then. So the best example for that might be, you know, Viagra or Nigerian prints or you know, there's various, you know, very kind of well-known scams that went around the internet. And they, they developed these spam filters just to try and pick out what are the keywords and if that, and, and if you've got a particular keyword, then it's going to mean that you get flagged and end up in the spam folder. Um, now, the thing now is that the world has changed very much because Google pioneered this, and, and all the other mailbox providers have done their best to follow suit with this. Is that they've invested a lot in artificial intelligence, so it's no longer good enough to just have a list of words that don't work. There are some words that you do need to be careful about, certainly. Um, and certainly if you're, you know, um, if you're using the word Viagra in email now, then yes, it probably still will end up in spam or promotions or whatever, but it's a lot more contextual than it used to be. I think that's the big difference um, because now it's not just the words themselves. The artificial, in artificial intelligence will look at what is the context behind it. Does it seem legitimate? So they're looking, obviously, they're trying to filter out the, the scams, the phishing emails, the, 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 the genuine spam. So they're going to look at how does the whole email sound? And if there's some dodgy words in there and the email looks dodgy in general, then yeah, absolutely, they're going to put it straight into spam. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, Adrian, but the, the thing is, we, I think everyone gets that. You know, if you use words like Viagra and other things like people that would expect that to go to spam, but you can get other cases, can't you? So, for example, if you run free events, we run a lot of free events. If you use free too often in your email, that's actually can actually a result of things going to the spam folder as well, because it increase the chance of going to spam. It's, it uh, certainly how, can do. How can, so how can people get round, not get round it, but how can they work with these filters to make sure those emails do get to the inbox rather than being filtered out as potential spam when they're not spam, I guess? It is a, it's a difficult one to answer because the one thing that we've proven time and time again is the more you try and game the system, the more it will catch you out. So yeah. in, the, in the in the good old days, people used to write, replace the word free with fr dot dot e e and things like that. And if you do that these days, then you will instantly be picked up because the, the, the technology is clever enough to realize this. So. You know, the, the first bit of advice I'd share is that you're more likely to dodge into the problem than to avoid it by trying to change things too much. So the, the best advice that I always offer is to just make the email as authentic as possible. And if it's sounding like you, then it, you'll get away with a few questionable words because at the end of the day, there's only so many ways that you can share a message. But at the same time, if you can say, if a free event, if you can advertise it in some other way and say it's complimentary or, or something like that, then that can kind of make a bit of a difference. But I did do a test recently where I actually put the word COVID into an email because obviously at the moment, then that is a, a very big trigger word um, because anything with that kind of word, a lot of people have been experiencing covid related um, phishing emails scams that kind of thing so there was a, a lot of noise about um if you if you put coronavirus or covid into an email you're going to go into spam um so i actually had a chance to test this out because evan who's a guy i work with in the us he actually he caught covid um at the start of the year um and happily you know it hit him 
quite hard, but he, you know, he was in bed for a couple of weeks and recovered. So I sent an email out to my audience saying that he'd actually been poorly and he'd had COVID and he got better. So what I did is I split it into two batches. Um, I sent half the emails out and I kind of made a veiled reference to, to what has happened. And the other one, I used the word COVID. And yes, there was a difference. One had a 32% open rate and one had a 36% open rate. So there was a little bit of a difference, but it wasn't enough for me to really lose sleep over because if there'd been no alternative but for me to put the word COVID in that email, yes, there'd have been, you know, three or 4% reduction, but it's not the difference between 30% and 10% as an example. So I think a lot of time, yes, the words and the content do matter. There's no doubt about that, but it's possible to get too paranoid about it as well. So yeah. I think it's more, it's, it's always going to be about common sense. If you go, to, if you, if you re review a list of a thousand phrases and try and avoid all of them, then you're going to end up getting ulcers because there's just, there's only so far that you can go. So I think it's always, with, with, with everything here, it's about getting that balance right because the content itself is only one small part of the equation that decides whether or not things are going to get through. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'd just like to pick out some of these comments because you asked some great questions a moment ago, uh, Adrian. So let's just give a bit of feedback here if that's all right. Uh, so Girish has said he sends about 600, um, he got 600 email addresses, doesn't send out regularly. Uh, Josh has referred to HubSpot um, and sending total emails to uh, tailored emails to each client. And uh, Nikki's referred to Infusionsoft, which I think you and Nikki know each other well. Yep. And uh, it was a list of, of hundreds, quality rather than quantity, and 30 to 40% open rates. So um, very good, Nikki. Uh, Mark's referred to, we use HubSpot total database around 30,000, but doesn't, don't email at all uh, at one time, uh, sorry, at, at all at one time with everything. I think I'm losing part of the comment there. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, no, that makes sense, and that's that's a very good practice yeah. as well. So, yeah, that's that makes uh, sense. Thomas is saying not now only email after engagement through social media channels. That's an interesting one. Uh, Simon's saying we have a few group emails of mail list, 20,000 subscribers total. Discovered mailer lights two years ago who are great and jumped away from MailChimp. We also have a problem with spam when sending first-time emails and invoices from our Gmail account. That's a an interesting one. Um, and then we've got Lisa, I use Kajabi, 300 uh, emails, open rate 25 to 40%. Some would, I, 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 if I forward an email that I want to recommend as a referral, why might I bounce back when it gets forwarded? Um, perhaps we'll come back to that question in just a moment, if that's all right. Um, Alex Ren has been quite nice to this on this one. Uh, I don't know where you understand that one, but he's saying, I guess the yeah. one definitely. A legitimate email could be one that meets the privacy and electronics comms regs. Not sure if they apply post Brexit. How should PECR influence access on marketing campaign? Um, perhaps we'll come back to that in a second. And uh, Lisa's referred to another example. When I send emails to my husband from our Gmail account to his Gmail account, he goes to spam even though he pulls them out of spam uh, and has made me a VIP. Why is that? So actually, there's two or three good points here in particular. Uh, lots of feedback from everyone, by the way. So thank you for that. Um, so let's perhaps uh, look at uh, look at Simon's one first. Actually, um, actually, I won't bring it up on the screen because uh, it obscures things a little bit. But it, uh, what what are your thoughts around Simon's question there, um, uh, Adrian? So I guess it depends on where it came from and why. Because what we found recently is that. There can be certain triggers in an email that it's okay if you if you receive it. As soon as you forward it on, then some sometimes the, the the amount of filtering starts to increase because what they're looking at there is so where where has it come from? And are there any links? Is there any content in that email that might be deemed suspicious for some reason? And I think sometimes it will depend on the platform that it came from as well. So I mean, I, we, there's there's a lot to go into here to really look into this because I think there's there's a lot of parameters around. Well, where where did the email come from? Who sent it? What platform do they send it through? Where are you forwarding it onto? Because it's always the combination of all of these things that can make the difference. So what I've found in some cases is if the email landing in your inbox, um, your your if your own if your own inbox provider 
um, has got a, a particular problem, they end up on some block list or something for a while, then that can be one reason. It could be that the actual email addresses or the links or the text in the email itself. Um, you know, it's one of those where I think I'd have to look at that in a bit more detail to be sure, because normally, you know, most people that I know they can forward an email and it does work. So that's probably one that, you know, some, some of these will have to understand that there's not a one size fits all answer for these, I think. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, actually, I've just realised the time that we enjoy ourselves so much. Uh, we've got haven't even started some of these other questions yet. Um, so, it, it, Lisa's raised a really interesting point about uh, Gmail going spam, even though it's been marks of the IP, um, even, and also people that's moving things out from spam back into the inbox again, which obviously is what the people encourage you to do. Any 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 initial thoughts? Might be like a thirty second answer to that, Adrian. Yeah, I think you know this is this is where it's worth looking at exactly you know who who the big three in the email world are and just how much they control our email as well because this is all very relevant because yeah. if we go back you know I mean I my my first email address was back in 1992 I think when I was at University of Bradford and I had a uh, an educational email address and then I've always used email since then um, and then obviously along came you know the the internet providers like you know remember NTL World and Telewest and people like that and BT Internet they they launched their own email addresses and that's what people started to use um, but more recently the majority of people now use a free email box from either Google or Microsoft or Yahoo and those three platforms typically control up to three quarters or even 90% of an entire email list if you if your business to business it's a bit different but if you've got if, if your if your typical audience is is either consumers or small businesses then you'll find that Google has typically got half of of your audience Microsoft may be another 10 15 20 percent and Yahoo maybe another 10 15 percent on top of that so those are the big three and they have made the biggest investment in what we're going to talk about now in terms of behavioral analysis and this is where they sometimes get it wrong unfortunately as well because um, I'm particularly in Lisa's case if she's going from her Gmail to his Gmail then in theory this is all within Google's little walled garden of what's happening um, so Google shouldn't have any reason reason to mistrust what's happening there based on where the email has come from. So what that normally means is there'll be something that's happened at some point where mistakenly something has been either identified as spam or it could be there could be some content in the email because what Google is looking at is it's looking at each individual person's reputation now because reputation is one of the biggest things that impacts whether your email makes it into the inbox. So again, it's difficult to get into the specific detail of, of that question without knowing you know, what the email addresses are and what the emails look like and all this kind of thing. Um, but what Google does is they will analyze all kinds of different things about every email that goes through in terms of who sent it, who it's being sent to, um, how it was sent, was it sent within the Gmail web interface or was it from an iPhone connected up or, or whatever. Um, and depending on, you know, they, they will effectively they will identify all the different risk factors in an email. And if the risk factor goes above a certain amount, then they're more likely to put it into the spam folder. Um, and the, the interesting thing is even, you know, if, if Lisa's saying that the husband's made, made her a VIP and it's still going to spam, then sometimes, you know, Google is really, really dogmatic about stuff. And the only way you can actually get around it is to create a filter inside the recipient's Gmail saying, for this particular sender, you create what's called a, a Gmail filter where you can say any emails from this address, never send it to spam. Yeah. Uh, and I had to do that for a couple of providers once where the reason I had to do it for them is because they had damaged their reputation so much that Google didn't trust them. Um, I doubt if that's the case between Lisa and her husband, but there's, there can be all kinds of crazy reasons. But yeah. the good news is if as soon as you're aware that someone is getting emails in the spam folder and they tell you, you can at least explain how to get around it because there's always a way of setting the system up so the, so you can tell it, ignore the spam filter for this particular email address. Yeah, I think one of the difficulties I, I see with a lot of this, and I, I was going to throw a couple of controversial statements saying Adrian would rise uh, to the challenge, <laughs> but I won't because obviously we need to try and work to a time scale because I could carry on a debate with Adrian all night long probably. Um, but I think one of the challenges is, is that also a lot of these email providers, re uh, re recipient, Google, Microsoft, the others, is they assume that people have got the time and the knowledge to be able to do these things and actually it could be made really difficult. For example, we get, I get cases, I'm sure everyone else does as well, where it suddenly goes into spam, you mark it perhaps half a dozen times, it's not spam, 
And then Google is stupid enough or Microsoft is stupid enough to keep on putting it back into spam again. So we're almost encouraging people not to train Google or Microsoft and the others because people then think, well, actually, they ignore my request. So they have to then get either more creative, more imaginative to make sure they do see those messages um, yeah. or that people just don't see them at all. And well, I think this, this, is, uh, this is one of the biggest challenges, sorry, sorry Rupert, because yeah. what what people don't realize is it's not just around what your behavior is anymore. What Google in particular are doing is they are crowdsourcing behavior monitoring and behavioral information. So supposing I've got an audience of 5,000 people. If, you know, let's say that half of those are on Google, so Google's seeing me send an email to 2,500 people every day now because I'm now sending a daily email. Um, and if enough people reported that email for spam on a daily basis, it wouldn't matter how many times you personally click the this is not spam button, then yeah. the crowd behavior drowns out what one person has done. So that's, that's the challenge. This is why, you know, luckily there are always ways going beyond that. So rather than just saying this is not spam, you can actually set up the filter like I described. But what's happening now in many cases is that the big three mailbox providers are looking very much at the big picture and they're saying, okay, so what is everyone doing with the emails that Rupert sends out? Are they opening them? Are they ignoring them? Are they clicking the spam button? Um, and I've got one client that came to me in a bit of a panic because they had reached the point where their, their open rate was at 0.2%. Wow. Uh, and the reason for that was because they had sent out so much garbage um, and so many people were just ignoring their emails and hitting the spam button that Google downgraded their reputation to as low as possible. And, and as, soon as, as soon as Google decided that um, they don't like someone, they will just deliver everything to the spam folder. Um, and you know, once that happens, you have to take very, very evasive action to do something about that. And luckily, um, you know, my, my friend Evan, who I mentioned, he's got a phrase, um, people go and have people go and swim in lake stupid. Um, and as long as you don't behave like a spammer, you won't normally get treated like a spammer. Yeah. I think this is a perfect time to actually answer Alex's question about PECR. Because yeah, it's fairly a, a simple response, because I'm just slightly concerned that we're going to lose people along the way on this bit, a bit far, yeah. far away. <laughs> this is the one that he's, that he's asked in the, in the comments, not the email yeah. one. Um, yeah. So, because what we, you know, the main thing we need to talk about really is, well, why do you need to change the way you send emails and what do you need to change? And Alex's question about, you know, definition of a legitimate email really hits the nail on the head here. Because the biggest mistake, I'm actually, co I'm covering two questions in one really, because we said we're going to talk about, you know, why you need to change the way you send emails, what the biggest mistakes are. So, the biggest fundamental mistake that people make, bar none, is that they will send emails to people that don't want to receive them and have indicated they don't want to receive them by ignoring them. And that's the that's the that's that's the biggest, most important thing people need to bear in mind. Firstly, if someone hasn't specifically told you they want to hear from you, don't mail them. And even if they have told you they want to hear from you, if they stop reading your emails, stop sending them the mails. Because what you know, this is this is what Google and Co are really looking at now. They're saying, okay, Adrian's got an audience of five thousand people. <clears throat> Only ten percent of Adrian's audience have opened something in the last thirty days. That means that Adrian's sending a load of junk out. We're going to downgrade his reputation because reputation is everything, and reputation is based on firstly avoiding doing the stupid things that I'll talk about if we've got time, but then secondly, it's about consistently only sending things to people who regularly open your emails. Um, you know, if someone hasn't indicated that they want to receive your emails, you you do not have legal permission to send anything anyway. There's a few exclusions around um, legitimate interest and things like that. But on the whole, you should be getting specific, explicit inf permission. Otherwise, it's a cold email, it's spam. And there's only one definition of spam or illegitimate email that matters. And that definition is whatever the recipient thinks it is. If someone receives an email from me and they don't like it, they're going to hit the spam button. So my job is to make sure that I don't send them something that they are likely to report as spam, which should be quite simple. Um, but I, you know, I still come across people even today who will, they will scrape email addresses off the internet. They will collect business cards without asking for permission. They will build, a, they will build a database of people. And then even though they have no permission, they will start sending emails and they wonder why they get spam complaints. They will wonder why they, they, they get, you know, lots of people opting out. So they'll wonder why people aren't opening their emails. So the biggest thing there is just to only send the emails to the people that have asked you for them. And as soon as they start reading, 
misleading them, bearing in mind that pretty much any email marketing platform out there has got the ability to tell you how recently someone opened something. You can say that if people haven't opened your emails for, say, three months, which is a very long time, then if they haven't opened anything for the last three months, what are the chances of them opening anything next week? It's very slim, very, very slim. Um, you know, I've done tests, and if you send emails only to the people that have engaged 90 days or longer ago, so that's to the people that haven't engaged, they haven't opened anything for a long time, if you get a 2% open rate to that part of your audience, you will be very lucky indeed. Because, you know, there's only there's only three reasons that people don't open emails and they don't engage with you. The first thing is because they're not seeing them and there's not much you can do about that. You've just got to give up. Um, you know, going back to what you said about other channels, Rupert, that's when you can engage with them on LinkedIn or direct mail or phone or whatever. But if they're not opening your emails, it doesn't matter how many you send out, that's not going to change whether they open them or not. Um, so, you know, taking that into account, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the biggest reason. Second reason is that they no longer have the problem that they wanted you to solve, in which case, again, there's not much point continue to try and engage with those people because they, you know, they've probably gone elsewhere. Or well, the third reason is just because they're not ready yet for you to solve their problem. And if they have switched off, it's your job to disrupt them enough to get them to re-engage with you. And again, if they don't re-engage, let them go. Um, yeah. my, this is where I'll make an unapologetic mention of a certain Disney movie. Um, go and watch the Frozen movie and let it go. There's no point sending emails repeatedly to people that don't want to hear from you. That's yeah, yeah. the biggest, biggest mistake people make. That's right. I, I, I think I'd still probably uh, refer back to the comments I made a bit earlier on, though. And this is where I think people like Microsoft, uh, Google and others have got to get a lot smarter. Um, obviously, you've got a, a, someone's referred to HubSpot earlier on today. Obviously, HubSpot is a, a very sophisticated uh, CRM solution. What it's particularly good at doing is measuring all si si types of different engagement, where it's from email or not, you know, yep. whether it's from social media, getting to certain pages on your website, all these other things. And the trouble is, I think, unfortunately, Microsoft and Google and others, you'd like to think they're way ahead. I'd actually argue they're behind the curve because people's communications habit now is not one channel, it's omni-channel. And the, to me, the next big thing is, is how we can move from this very uh, you know, linear world to a much more interactive world, which is much more in tune with the way that people interact with things now. And that's a very big question. <laughs> and I don't think Adrian, uh, you or I would be able to probably answer that one because probably we can't influence enough, but yeah, have a go. <laughs> oh, be interesting. I'm gonna be a little bit contrarian with this because while it's all well and lovely that you can engage with these people via the other routes, then what that means really is if someone's engaging, if someone's going to your website because they've found you on LinkedIn or, or whatever, then there's i don't think you're ever going to get them to engage via email so really it's more it's more around you know choose your battles wisely because <laughs> you can't force people to engage in a way they don't want to now from my perspective i do not really exist on social media you know i i occasionally comment on facebook and things like that um but the decision that i have made um and it's, it's a little bit easier for me i guess because i'm existing in the email world but if someone doesn't want to engage with me by email then they're not my clients and i will quite happily let them go because otherwise i could invest lots of time energy money everything else trying to get a huge following on linkedin or instagram or facebook or whatever um but for me, you know, and I'm not a big brand like Nike or something like that. If you're a big brand, then obviously you can invest in multi-channel. You can do a really good job. Um, but for, for my preference is I would rather train my audience to follow me on email. And if they don't want to do that, I'm totally cool with that. Um, you know, they, they might find some other email expert on social media, but, but they probably won't. The thing to bear in mind really is that when they find me, they're going to come and they're going to, they're going to sign up for one of my freebies, whether it's my health check or my checklist or whatever. They're going to have to sign up to my email for that. Now, if they then grab that, consume the information, then go away and never engage with me again, I'm cool with that. I will stop mailing them. Hopefully, I will help them a little bit, and then it's goodbye. If they do engage with me on Facebook, that's great. But if someone comments on Facebook, the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, go, go over to my website and do this. And then they're back on email again. So I'm, you know, I'm rather than try and make water flow uphill because 
unfortunately, it's always going to be very difficult for the Googles and Microsofts of this world to see what's going on on social media. I will more accept the status quo. Um, you know, I still have, I still regularly laugh when people say that email is dead because you know, if email is dead, why am I getting a 50% open rate on the emails I send out? And why have 77% of my audience opened something from me in the last 30 days? Yeah. So you know, it's about choosing what works for you. There are some people that won't touch email, they will use social media, and I'm totally cool with that as well. Um, you know, it's, it's what's the right tool for the right job. And email does work really well for many audiences, it doesn't work for others. But let's, let's face it, who would be in Donald Trump's shoes right now? He was banned by social media and he's got no platform anymore. Now, I'm sure he has got a bit of an email list, but you know the lesson there is email is a lot less um, susceptible to being interfered with by big business. Yes, you can still upset Google. You can get blocked by Google and all that kind of thing. But you've got a lot more ability to get back into the game because you can you can put your you can you can kind of. Um, put things right you know even even donald trump could probably get back on email at some point but twitter are never going to let him near ever again <laughs> so it is about understanding you know every single channel out there every platform has its pros and cons it has its purpose um but i would say that if people aren't engaging with you on email they probably never will let them go stick with linkedin for those people stick with email for the others and it is its horses for courses adrian that's lovely thank you very much what we're going to do is uh we're going to have about a three or four minute uh, wrap up as it were if, if a couple of you would like to ask some questions do put them in the chat we'll see where we can sneak one or two questions in at the very end as well if adrian's happy to do so so adrian sure. i'll come back to you in just a second so bear with me as i say this is your chance guys girls on the in the chat just to ask anything else you'd like to to have asked uh, answered by adrian uh, but uh, in terms of uh, just moving ahead for the next three or four minutes on a couple of points um, we have a great guest speaker next week, plus also live Q and A. Uh, the person con uh, concerned, this lovely guy, um, is going to be with us, and he's going to be focusing. Uh, it's a will guy, a gentleman called Will Barrett. He runs a, a family business which has been around for about 170, 180 years. Um, very much uh, a, a social enterprise. So here with a much bigger purpose. And it, the, the, the topic is basically business growth: the tortoise or the hare. In other words, which is best. And it particularly is looking at what's in the new world order, new beginnings, what next? Why running a business with a strong social purpose can be profitable? Um, extraordinary times requires exceptional leadership. And why select customers are, that are true to your core values? Why it's so important to do that? And how to leave a lasting legacy with your business? And we're not necessarily talking about just money there, but it's also talking about how you can have uh, the biggest impact. Um, clearly, what we encourage people to do as well uh, amongst everyone amongst our community and those of you joining us today, uh, do reach out to each other and also uh, focus on building a referral mindset, also build, ex accelerate that deep relationship of trust. And in fact, everything Adrian has talked about today is actually building trust with your community, or your email list, so people do want to, uh, to hear from you and, and get the value that you're sharing. Um, we've got our next uh, mini conference on the 2nd of March. Uh, it's called Spring into 2021, because the clocks are changing a few weeks after that, which uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to. Um, th those of you who are regulars to that, um, obviously the first part will be similar to what you've seen before, um, but the second part this time around is going to be a little bit more of a, a series of breakout sessions, uh, so a little bit different this time around. So do register for that if that interests you, and the way you can get access to these uh, things is, uh, and what sorry, what's going to be covered as part of that basically how to bring your sales forward, amplify your brand, leverage technology to get your time back. And also we talk about your product mix, your marketing mix, also how you can get more sales through LinkedIn and how the business growth time machine can make a big difference. Uh, it's, uh, I'd love to pretend it can time travel. It can give you your time back and also help you to bring sales forward. Bit of a play on words there, uh, but I'm sure you get the point. Um, in terms of how you do that, if you want to get to any of those, just go to the homepage of our website, which is businessgrowthbureau.tv. Um, you can rest for the mini conference, the homepage, the on-demand webinar. If you're very restricted for time, just sort of go for the on-demand webinar. Um, it's very condensed, the content, but shares massive amounts of value. And also the weekly live streams with expert speakers. Um, and also we've got the diagnostic health check. If you want to register for the live streams, we suggest choosing the recurring option rather than hitting continue. 
Uh, the reason is very simple. It saves you having to re-register each week because I know a number of you are regulars on uh, this call. Um, and uh, if you, any of you want to see how well your business is performing overall, um, just complete this sales and marketing diagnostic. And um, we've actually considerably enhanced that actually over the last week. It's now produces quite a detailed report on five key areas in your business, which are personalized uh, to you. Um, so you get to that by just going to businessgrowthbureau.tv diagnostic. And um, uh, so in terms of contact details, um, Adrian's contact details are there. So it's deliver deliverability dashboard. <laughs> Can I never get my words my mouth? Is that your main website, uh, Adrian? The so that, that's for the, that's for the dashboard software. What I've what I've admitted to mention is there's the the checklist that I've created as well, which. Um, it summarizes a few of the points that I've mentioned today, but obviously we've not had a huge amount of time, but then the, the checklist goes into a lot more detail behind that with the, the you know, the really the, the most important areas. So okay. it's probably worth um, mentioning that at the same time. Yeah, I, in fact, I was going to ask you about that actually. Uh, if people want a, a copy of that checklist, can they email you via this address and ask for um, it? Yeah, Adrian? You can do that, or the easiest thing is you can see where we've got deliverabilitydashboard.com as the address. If you just put slash checklist on the end of that address, and that will take them straight to the page where they can download the checklist. And if they want to sign up for my emails, then they can. Um, but it's optional. You can just download the checklist and just go yeah. through it and have a look. Okay. It is a very good uh, checklist, by the way. It's not um, something that Adrian's put together in five seconds flat. There's a lot of time and thought gone into it. Um, actually, just in summary, uh, in fact, we'll come on to that just a second, Adrian, actually. Um, let's come back to that. So just remember that. So it's liverydashboard.com forward slash checklist. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a one word checklist, isn't it? So it's not complicated. Yeah. Nikki, Nikki, Nikki's got it there for us. She just shared that. So thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. That's really helpful. Um, Adrian's phone number is there as well, and also Adrian's uh, email address. So Adrian at adriansavage.co.uk. Uh, um, now, just to make sure we cut, well, we'll just flip back quickly so we can see you again. And Mira, if you want to drop in as well, uh, by all means do. I wish you the wrong button. Does help. Um, yeah, so any sort of last questions that have come, come out at the moment? Uh, right, so Alex made the point, but I've been emailing and messaging for 42 years, and today I've still learned things. Thanks for the session. So that's quite a recommendation from Adrian, um, Alex, actually, Adrian, because uh, 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 Alex has formerly had 5,000 people reporting to IBM. So wow. There isn't much he doesn't know about. Um, I think... Uh, long since stepped away to do other bigger and bolder things. Um, but thank you for that, Alex. Um, I don't think anyone else has raised any closing questions or points. Have we missed anything particularly today? Let's have a quick scan back. Yeah. And um, Adrian, so just tell us as well a little bit more about what this checklist does. So you, is it called Seed or something? What's it? Um, Sure. Okay. So we've got the race method checklist and the race yeah. stands for reputation, authentication, content and engagement. And those are the four main areas that you know, if you get all of those bits right, you're stacking the odds in your favor. There was actually a question that I think um, Simon mentioned. It also have a problem with spam when sending first time emails in invoices from our from our Gmail account. And that sounds like there could be a reputation issue there. So I think that's definitely something that's worth, um, you know, if you're finding that if there's someone who you've never mailed before and your email is going to their spam folder, that suggests there's probably some kind of um, underlying problem with your email reputation. Um, and was, again, this is getting a little bit geeky, um, but Google actually offer a free tool called Google Postmaster Tools. Um, and if you just Google for that, it takes a bit of setting up and you've got to be sending more than, you know, at least a thousand emails a month before you appear on their radar. But Google Postmaster Tools will tell you what Google thinks of your reputation. And if it's high, then that's good. If it's medium, you're okay. Low or bad, then you've done something to upset them. So that's always one of the first ports of call to check um, just to make sure that your reputation is okay because if Google doesn't like you the chances are that other people won't as well so yeah. that's that was Simon's question there I don't think we've had any others come in since then no it's lovely so just to touch and I think race is a great word by the way which stands for re reputation authentication content engagement is that yep. that's it yeah, I think we've talked a lot about that today haven't we so the fundamental thing is if we can remember those four words, so race, reputation, authentication, content, engagement, and do, say do uh, reach out for 
Adrian's um, checklist because it's a very, very good. You'll get lots of value from it. Um, so I'm pleased to say, I think we can call this um, a, a, a wrap and uh, uh, very great for everyone taking part. Adrian, thank you very much. Uh, bit of lively discussion. I'm sure we could have carried this on for at least two hours, um, but uh, I think everyone wants to get uh, home. And uh, Adrian, if you should stay with us for a minute or two, Mira, obviously, but uh, the rest of you, thank you very much for joining us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week at five to five for five o'clock start. That's GMT. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye.